Maintenant, euh, je vais inviter euh, Irova euh, Loranco à préparer sa présentation. Euh, Irova, euh, il... un des avantages de faire ça par euh, vidéoconférence, euh, c'est que Irova va présenter um, his uh, talk uh, from uh, the UK, so from uh, the other side of the ocean. Uh, so Irova. Uh, let us know about uh, the wood anatomy. Yes, I'm going to try to uh, share my screen with you guys. Just let me know if you can it's see my screen. Up. Yes, we loading can. Up. It's starting with thank you. Okay, I, I'm starting. Thank you, guys. So let me go. <laughs> Sorry about that. But can you see the screen, the screen white? Right? Okay. Yeah, good ready thank to go. Thank you. Yeah, so first, thank you for uh, the, this opportunity to presenting my study. And uh, I'm going to present to, for you today resolving water transport issues. Jack Pines Island makes no trade off between hydraulic efficiency and safety. Nova? I'm going to start. Yes? You're not in presentation mode. I'm not in presentation mode? No. Okay. Let me just... What about now? There you go. Okay. Thank you, Adan. So a quick introduction here. So uh, the scope, uh, the advantage of having both hydraulic safety and efficiency is a self-evident and expected outcome for natural selection, right? So despite of this, uh, I just wanna select a pointer here quickly. But despite of this, we have this uh, hypothesis saying that plants cannot be both, right? Or they are safety or efficient. So according to this hypothesis, uh, plants should be, uh, this have this wider vessels, they would be more hydraulic efficient and, but they would take more risk of cavitation, like a bubbles in the system, right? And this would cause this uh, stop of the water conductivity in the vessels. And then the way the plants would control this would be uh, reducing the size of the vessel. So this is the hypothesis of uh, safety efficiency trade-offs. Some paperwork's trying to see that, actually they found out the trade-offs weak. And some very interesting paper of this guy, uh, Liu, in 2019, say that uh, brings some interesting hypotheses like uh, plants species adapted to seasonality should be capable of optimized hydraulic safety and efficiency. And of course, uh, we, we have this idea because the plants in boreal regions, they have to cope with this extreme, uh, extremely high environmental viability, right? So they could be maybe optimized in this. So in another critic about this hypothesis, this trade-off hypothesis, is that the model neglects the complexity of plant hydraulics and its multiple traits. So again, the trade-off just consider vessels and trachytes, right? But there are, there are much more traits there and xylem, wood anatomy is something very complex, okay? So one of the traits uh, the proposal should be more investigated is the interconduit pits or this hydraulic microvalves. Just show an example here uh, between conifers and angiosperms, right? So notice by the scale here, the much larger in conifers and have some differentiation, the stickened portion in the, in the center, which is called thorus. So that uh, should work just like a hydraulic microvalve when the vessel become embolized, trick in this case, right? When the trick had become embolized, the torus is displaced and then block the passage of the air that in, uh, increases the embolism resistance of the conifers and that allow bypass the embolized vessels and keep the water conductivity up to the leaves. So in that increases hydraulic efficiency as well. Uh, some studies uh, from Haki and other uh, 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 authors, they shows that this uh, hydraulic microvalves 
they can increase over 50 percent of the water transporting conifers. Okay, so that's very important. Double function, both resistance and hydraulic efficiency. So it would be very important to check if you are studying now uh, drought resistance in conifers, checking this uh, trait, which is called torus overlap, or the extent to which the torus cover the pit aperture. Because some plants may vary this trait, and if they, the, the torus is not that big, uh, that would cause this torus displacement, and then letting the whole hydraulic system to fail and the plant to die, right? So now jumping for the species, we studied these four species, uh, which were, were grown in for Hedbom Monsi and Quebec City. Okay, we had some clues regarding their drought tolerance and we have this mission, this objective of investigate the seasonal dynamics, in the wood hydraulic architecture of this species. And we did that in uh, different trimmings because we were interested in see this dynamics, right? So again, the species looks like they, they handle really well this environmental uh, viability across this analysis. So let's investigate that. A little bit of the study and uh, how I did the, the process in the lab, I used a laser mi mi microscope. So you can see the laser wiping out the sample here, right? And some waves are going down. Each wave you can see from up to down is a very thin layer of a, a couple hundred uh, nanometers. So this is a nanometer scale. And I compressed all these layers. I did around a hundred uh, uh, layers like that. And to do this 3D reconstruction, as you can see in my screen now. So we did over 500 images like that for many individuals, many regions in the tree ring to see this dynamics and just notice here the stars I was talking about, this uh, micro valve here, right? The connection between the trachids, the trachids are those uh, tubes, are those bigger ones transporting water up to the leaves, okay? And as uh, proposed before, I mean, Zalim is very complex, so we need to investigate more traits, so let's do it. So I, we did some traits, kind of uh, created this trait, uh, uh, we named it trachyte pit net size, which is the connectivity, lateral connectivity between trachytes given the, uh, this micro valves, right? Also pit density, number of pits, and tricky density as well. All this would be very important for the hydraulic safety, right? Uh, increasing this control of the embolism and also increasing the pathway redundancy by this many trickets. And also the, oh, another one, the tricky uh, wall reinforcement as well. And very negative water pressure in the drought, having the sticking uh, cell wall it would be very important for this species. And some uh, traits linked to efficiency, hydraulic efficiency. Notice I'm repeating again the tricky, the pits, because this double function, right? Efficiency and safety. And also we added the tricky lumen, which is the traditional one. And some very uh, detailed measurements also did in this uh, pit traits. I'm just giving an idea. I'm talking here about five microns. That's very, very small, right? So this is the aperture of this, uh, the speeds, this hydraulic microvalves, and also the chamber as well. Did all these measurements and used some methods. Uh, one of them uh, to do the analysis was the network statistics because the hydraulic architecture a complex system with many traits, then the interaction between the hydraulic traits is key to understand the hydraulic system functioning. So this, quickly talking about this method, I mean, it has been used to understand social, human social uh, behavior in the, in the uh, internet or even uh, gene interactions. And now this understanding that phenotypic plasticity or a species to be suitable in the environment doesn't change just one trait, but there's interaction of many traits in order to make the species more like suitable to the environment, right? And, and this is an example how this should look like. I'm gonna show you the, some results. So we have here the big bubbles, which in my case is the trait, 
right? If you were like a human society, it would be one person, for example. But this, in my case, is one trait that I measured. And then the size of the trait means the importance or uh, the trait centrality, right? And the connection between them, the strength of, co of correlations. So I'm going to jump to the question. Uh, first, how seasonal variability influence the wood hydraulic properties in conifer seedlings? So uh, I'm going to show this graph for you. I have the three traits very important here in the pits, like pit aperture or this, um, uh, this aperture here, this hollow here, uh, torus size, which is the, the plug, right? And pit diameter is the size of the chamber. So first, uh, jack pine, notice very high correlation. That means there's a well-coordinated change in the pit of jack pine across the growing season and across the years. And another important thing is the scaling relationship equals two. That means for a given change, the pit aperture, let's say three, the torus size double, like six and so on. What are the implications of that? It's this. So I have the torus overlap, keep it stable across the growing season for the early wood to the late wood, right? Keeping so the embolism resistance is stable. And at the same time, the change, the pit diameter, the, the pit chamber also keeps the hydraulic efficiency, the space that the water can flow across uh, the pit. That doesn't happen, for example, with balsam fir. Notice the scaling relationship is very low and the correlations also is low. That means uh, balsam fir uh, varies a lot. The torus overlap in the early wood, for example, where usually have more water available. If there is a drought, for example, the species would be much more prone to uh, cavitate and embolism and so on. And this would be the result. Torus display cement. Okay, so looks like Jack Pan can co-optimize uh, this hydraulic uh, safety efficiency and balls of fur trade off across the growing season. So quickly, the second and last question, are pit traits interaction important uh, for the wood dynamics in conifer? So we, we saw this, all this variability and I wanna know how that is important take considering all the traits we measured, right? And there we go. So uh, T and eight, storage and aperture. So looks, uh, is very central to Jack Pine interaction in, in all those traits, hydraulic traits. So that means the variation in pit torus and aperture is central for jack pine adjust its hydraulic architecture across the season. I'm gonna show you a comparison again for balsam firm, just showing about balsam firm, but the other species have a very similar behavior, right? Just for simplicity, I'm showing just these two species. So I noticed that it's quite different, right? The speed diameter and net size. So like a pit diameter and net size variability looks more important to balsam fir. And I wanna uh, highlight something else, DO, which is the overlap. Uh, for a given change in uh, balsam fir hydraulic efficiency, given the size of the pit or uh, the size of the trachytes, there is some negative consequences to the torus overlap. So there is a conflict between increasing hydraulic efficiency and keeping hydraulic safe in jack pine and no negative association in jack pine, right? So this looks like the species can increase hydraulic efficiency and in keeping bullets and resistance at the same time. So again, optimize, uh, jack pine optimize and balsam fur trade off this. So summarizing what I presented to you today, so methods in laser microscopy provide a feasible way to rapidly assess the wood architecture. The pit aperture torus covariance can optimize the safety and efficiency, which is central to, uh, for the seasonal hydraulic dynamics in jack pine seedlings. Uh, I want to acknowledge the support of Danny Shaw, Danny Wool, uh, Louis Duchesne, and the institutional support. It was quite important to me to develop this research. I'm, I thank you so much for this. And of course, uh, all of you for uh, attending this presentation and I'm gonna be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jehovah. Nice uh, way of showing how uh, Jack Pine is a little bit different than some of the other species out there. Uh, we have time now for the questions in French or in English.
Euh, on peut le faire par le chat ou vous pouvez lever vos mains et on peut euh, les prendre ainsi. Y a-t-il une question? Euh, sinon, je peux lancer une question à Francis qui euh, est venu rapidement dans le, pour nous dépanner. Euh, Francis, euh, tu as parlé un peu comment le type de dépôt euh, s'influence. Euh, Francis est toujours là. Euh, oui, je suis là. <rire> OK. Euh, je suis curieux aussi pour euh, la création des euh, ressources chaque année, à quel point le type de dépôt va interagir avec, euh, disons, euh, une une grande euh, accumulation de neige ou euh, de pluie printanière, y a-t-il des dépôts qui, pour lesquels euh, on voit beaucoup de variations interannuelles ou est-ce qu'on n'est pas encore rendu là à regarder euh, comment l'hydrographie peut changer d'une année à l'autre? Euh, ben, en fait, euh, je pense que entre les années, là, la variabilité interannuelle, euh, on, en effet, on n'est pas rendu là. Puis euh, ce que j'ai observer sur le terrain et lire dans, dans ma revue littérature, c'est que ça n'a pas tant une grosse influence plus que la nature même locale des dépôts de surface. Donc, euh, tout ça pour dire que l'endroit où s'initie un cours d'eau euh, risque d'être assez stable d'une année à l'autre, puis euh, la variabilité est plus due à, à vraiment l'influence locale. T'sais, dans le fond, ça, il y a un gradient de processus d'écoulement de surface entre c'est ça, un processus d'écoulement de surface et souterrain. Puis euh, tout dépendant de ce qui se passe en amont du bassin versant, bien, ça va beaucoup euh, influencer la, la présence ou non d'un lit de cours d'eau. Puis euh, la, en fait, la, les, les endroits où les processus sont plus souterrains, c'est-à-dire là où la nappe phréatique est impliquée, où les dépôts de surface sont épais, bien, clairement que là, il va y avoir une plus grande stabilité dans le lit d'écoulement versus un endroit en pente forte où euh, c est, c est des, les lits d'écoulement sont plus euh, issus de processus euh, de, de, plus, de forte pluie. Fait que, à ces endroits-là où les processus sont plus d'écoulement de surface et où les dépôts sont minces, ben là, probablement qu'il pourrait avoir une plus grande variabilité interannu interannuelle basée sur euh, des récurrences de pluie. Euh, par exemple, la pluie la plus forte euh, à tous les deux ans, c'est quelque chose que j'ai lu là, à quelques reprises. Okay. Excellent. Et je sais qu'au Maine euh, et à autre état aux États-Unis, euh, la cartographie pour euh, essayer de euh, mieux prévoir les zones de protection forestière et tout, euh, est vraiment un outil euh, assez intéressant, puissant pour s'assurer qu'on ne se plaigne pas après le coup, après coup, qu'on ne savait pas qu'il y avait des ruisseaux qui étaient là pour euh, les traverser, tout ça. Donc, euh, Bel avenir. Yeah. Oui, tout à fait. Y a-t-il d'autres personnes avec des questions? Peut-être une question pour Thibault. Oui. On sait euh, que... Dan, il y a une question dans le chat euh, qui a été oh. amenée par Alain Paquette. Pour Jehovah, what would be the expected covariations and trade-offs for angiosperms? What traits should be measured? Uh, Alain, tu peux compléter si tu veux. No, you did pretty good. <laughs> and and this, is a great this is a great question for those yeah. who didn't understand differences between angiosperms and gymnosperms. There's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun thinking angiosperms came later and they're supposed to be better, uh, maybe better adapted and gymnosperms kick butt uh, for a lot of uh, hydraulic. So yeah, go Yehovah. Uh, I, yeah. I would just add that it was a great presentation, you know, I love your uh, animations. Uh, oh, we can, you. It's, it's really easy to understand. Ah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it's always complicated. I mean, showing this ah. very intricate uh, little pieces which is there. Always I feel my job is showing these things that's quite difficult to see, right? So, yeah, so that's a good question. And, and uh, my understanding, I, after this experience of studying this species, I, 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 my understanding now is that conifers, they are very, very different uh, in comparison to angiosperms. Like if, if you see like 
Uh, and there are ma many papers out there. I mean, that's not something novel. I mean, I'm talking about, but for me, it was quite stunning to see. And and it, uh, if you want to study angiosperms, I would say it's important to study parenchyma, right? Because because angiosperms they don't have uh, that high embolism resistance. This is a nice, very nice paper. But I just don't remember right now what's the author, but they show that two columns, angiosperms and gymnosperms, what the difference between them. And one is that our conifers very high in bolism resistance because of the pits, that differentiation, right, is control the water and that pass a lot of water, sometimes block the air. And, and that there is no a similar uh, trait in, in angiosperms. So they are not so in bolism resistant, but they can refill the vessels. And how they refill the vessels? With this storage of water in the parenchyma. And now some folks here from Exeter, where I, I am right now, they're studying the bark as well. And sometimes the bark can refill this uh, vessels and angiosperms. I, I would say studying this both uh, uh, traits, I think would be quite uh, interesting to bring some more ideas. Uh, yeah, because uh, I mean, I would say angiosperms, they have this high water capacitance. They storage water in the tissue, something that doesn't happen that much in, in conifers. And I'm not saying that they don't, because actually the very tiny trachytes in the late wood, this is where the, some water keeps storage uh, across the growing season, right? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, I'm advance here don't question when she's posing question at the table. Can you vote for? Okay, Tibo, to sound it, to pre un peu à ce que t'as trouvé. Je me demande, uh, la littérature semble suggérer que, uh, le flux de sève, le verbe transpiration est contrôlé par multiple factors. Uh, le déficit de pression de vapeur, c'en est un, et peut-être un des plus importants en temps normal. Quand on arrive uh, au moment de sécheresse, uh, uh, il, il, il peut avoir le contenu uh, en, de ténure en eau du sol qui probablement. <coughs> ainsi que la radiation aussi est importante est probablement plus important au début de la journée quand le, le déficit de pression de vapeur devient plus important à la fin de la journée. Après avoir la température maximum, il pourrait y avoir toute une série de facteurs. Donc, je pense que c'est une hypothèse que l'ouverture, le sèchement des sols a une influence et aussi la végétation qui peut protéger le sol ou compétitionner euh, une un élu, un euh, relation de vrai assez s'attendre qu'une simple mesure de surface intérieure va bien prédire, me semble un peu simpliste comme théorie. Donc, je suis content de voir que tu développes et pousses ça plus loin. Mais à quel moment durant la journée est-ce que tu as mesuré, est-ce que as, tu présentes les moyennes, est-ce que a pris les mesures à certains moments parce que le moment de la journée va être aussi très important pour ce que tu observes. Alors, pour mes mesures, euh, c'est des mesures répétées. En gros, toutes les mesures, c'était toutes les 15 minutes. Et ce que j'ai fait, c'est que je n'ai pas inclus les jours qui étaient euh, très, très humides, donc avec un, des VPD qui étaient proches de zéro. Ça, je ne les ai pas inclus. Mais en gros, mes mesures, c'est des mesures répétées toutes les 15 minutes et ce que j'ai fait c'est que je les ai moyennés à la journée afin bah oui afin d'avoir des moyennes journalières et afin de pouvoir comparer euh, bah, je sais pas si on peut dire comparer au jour au jour, au jour mais voir l'évolution euh, journalière et euh, l'élément qui me manque et que, que j'ai beaucoup de peine avec ça c'est euh, l'humidité relative du sol c'est parce que j'avais installé un dispositif pour le suivi euh, de l'humidité à l'étude du sol et ça n'a pas marché et du fait de la pandémie on en avait commandé d'autres dispositifs 
Donc, ce qui fait que je n'ai pas pu les recevoir et celui que j'ai installé, ça n'a pas marché. Donc, ça, c'est le point le plus... Ouais, qui, je ne sais pas, c'est le point qui je suis le plus triste parce que ne pas avoir ces données-là, c'est... Je pense que si je les avais eues, j'aurais pu expliquer beaucoup mieux ce que j'ai observé parce que je peux essayer d'utiliser, par exemple, les précipitations, mais ça ne m'indiquera jamais l'humidité relative du sol. Enfin, ouais, c'est l'élément qui me manque dans... Dans mon étude, et ça, j'en suis vraiment très triste, on va se le dire. Donc, euh, donc. Ouais, parce qu'il y a une, une bonne débat aussi, est-ce que, à quel point le teneur en haut du sol devient important euh, ouais, oui, pour ces relations-là. Donc, euh, oui, effectivement, dommage. Oui, c'est ça. C'est, c'est, ouais, c'est l'élément, l'élément ouais, le, qui me manque. Ouais, ouais. OK. Merci. Y a-t-il euh, quelqu'un d'autre qui aimerait poser une question? Sinon, prendre une courte pause euh, avant d'y aller à la prochaine euh, session qui commence à 10h30. Je vous remercie. Je remercie euh, Félix d'avoir dépanné à dernière minute et vous autres d'avoir euh, accepté de l'ajustement de l'horaire euh, selon ce qui a été fait. J'aimerais remercier tous les conférenciers, uh, all the speakers for uh, their great talks, um, uh, putting together things in a uh, beautiful, clear, concise fashion. Donc, uh, merci beaucoup à tout le monde et uh, bonne continuation de colloque.